What's going on YouTube and welcome to Revolution Online. My name is Brad Chandler. I'm the middle school pastor here at Westridge and I'm so glad you're here. Man, we have got an amazing night planned because this is our last revolution of 2021. That's right. It's the last one of the year and we have been doing this really cool series called Gifted. We're going to wrap that up tonight. See what I did there? Wrap up a series called Gifted. Just saying, we got jokes, okay? So we're going to do that here in just a little bit, but I wanted to make sure you knew about some of our Christmas plans we've got at Westridge Church because you might not have a church home or your family might not have a church home and you're looking for somewhere to go for Christmas Eve and we would love to invite you to be a part of our Christmas Eve services. There's five identical options for you to pick from from December the 23rd through December the 24th. And so I'm going to go in order, right, of time and when they're available. So on December 23rd, you've got a 5 o'clock and a 7 o'clock option in the afternoon and evening. And then the next day, Christmas Eve, we have a 1 p.m., a 3 p.m., and a 5 p.m. option for you to come and be a part of. All five are identical. All five have kids' ministry available um, and would love for you to be a part of them if you're looking for somewhere to go this Christmas. Now, if you're a student listening to this and you're like, yeah, I, I'm going to be I'm going to be there or um, this is my church or whatever. Feel free to invite your friends to come to this with you or a neighbor or again, it might be the rest of your family to come be a part of this because it's just a great opportunity to hear the story of Jesus and what we're really celebrating at Christmas, which is a huge part of what we're going to actually talk about tonight as we end our series called Gifted. So. Last thing I wanted to mention other than the Christmas Eve services is that we are going to have a little hiatus for two weeks for Christmas and New Year to celebrate those, spend some time with our families and friends, and just celebrating uh, all that God has given us and what he's done, specifically with Jesus at Christmas time. And then as we get ready for a new year, just thanking him for the year that we just got to experience and just praying for the year that's coming up. And so we won't be meeting for the next two weeks, both in person as well as online. So the next time we'll be together will be January the 5th, where we're going to have our YouTube video right back up online, as well as being in person at Revolution at Westridge. So, hope you'll join us back after tonight on January the 5th. Now, with all that out of the way, let's jump in and let's finish our gifted series with the actual birth of the Messiah. So, check this out and then we'll jump into it. All right, everybody. So we have had a great past couple of weeks. We've had some amazing guest teachers with Blake and Dakota coming in the past two weeks. And just to give a quick little recap, because I think it really helps us in tonight understanding where we're going and what we're doing. Okay. So this whole series is called Gifted. It's about the greatest gift that's ever been given, which is Jesus to humanity, Jesus to the world. And so this is what Christmas is all about. This is why we are looking at this particular uh, set of teachings for the past three weeks because it's Christmas time. It is the season. Tis the season. We're decking the halls and we are jingling the bells. You know what I'm saying? So we need to figure out what in the world are we celebrating? Why are we celebrating it? And so the first couple of weeks of this series were really important because the first one was the promise of the Messiah. It's these promises and prophecies of this Savior that's going to come into the world to fix what was broken by sin. And so Jesus has been promised ever since way back in the beginning in Genesis chapter 3. We see this, this introduction to this plan that God has for redeeming humanity, redeeming you and redeeming me uh, because we have this issue with sin. So he promises this way back in the day and continues to reiterate his promises and even gives specifics as to who this Messiah is going to be. So that was week one. Blake covered that. It was great. Go back and look at it on YouTube. It is up there. And then last week, Dakota came in and talked about the actual announcement of the Messiah. So it's like, hey, I'm going to send this Messiah, this Savior to you who's going to rescue you. And this is what he's going to look like. And here's the promises. Here's the prophecies. And then last week, it's okay. Now we're, it, we're at the time. Like he's coming. 
And specifically, I'm going to tell the two people that are going to bring him into the world what my plan is and who their kid is going to be. So this is Mary and Joseph, and this is the kind of the plan that Jesus uh, has for coming into the world is through these two people, specifically through Mary, but Joseph is the adopted father here who's going to help raise Jesus. And so God tells both Mary and Joseph in two separate ways how he's going to bring about Jesus coming into the world and how they're going to play a part in this huge story. And they're just a young couple. They had no idea this is what God was going to do with their life. But they responded in faith and they trusted. And they followed through on what God called them to. And so today and what we're going to look at tonight is specifically the follow-up on that. It's after God tells Mary and Joseph about the plan to bring Jesus into the world. What did that actually look like? What did it look like when Jesus was born? And a lot of us maybe have heard bits and pieces of the story, but we've never heard the whole thing laid out. And so, especially when you remember, this has been a building moment for like thousands of years. God has been promising this for a long, long time. People have been looking forward to the Messiah coming for generations. And so when we talk about Jesus being born, like this is a huge deal. And hopefully the past two weeks help that make more sense as we read this story tonight. So there's different pieces of the story that we could read. We're just going to focus on the story when it's told from the perspective of Luke chapter 2. And we're going to read verses 1 through 21. We're going to read through that whole section. And we'll kind of pause along the way to talk about it and, and why this was a big deal or what this means. And then after we read through the whole thing, we'll break down just kind of two main points before we are kind of wrapping it up for the night and praying and getting into some of our Christmas festivities here in the next few weeks. But let's read through this story together and then we'll take it from there. Okay, so this is Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. It'll pop up on the screen, so read along with me. It says, In those days Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken for the entire Roman world. Now, in verse 3, it says, And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. So let's pause right there after verse 4 and talk about why that's a big deal, and then we'll keep reading, okay? So it's important to know that Jesus comes from the line of David through Joseph and Mary both, because that's where the promised Messiah is going to come from. He's going to be in the lineage of King David. You know, David and Goliath, the guy who killed Goliath. That's King David. And so ultimately, one of his relatives is going to be the Messiah. And so it's important for the author to tell us, hey, Joseph went to his hometown. It's this town, which is the town of David, because he's from the line of David, because it matches up with the promises God's already made. Okay, so that's why it's important. That's why it's in the story. So let's keep reading verse 5. It says, He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Now let's pause again after verse 7. Now, I've had a baby before. We've had three of them, me and my wife. We have three boys. They're 10, 7, and 5 years old. So I can tell you with our first, with Cooper, everything is just heightened. Like you're more aware of everything. You you have tons of questions. You're really nervous. You don't know what's going on because you've never experienced this before. So Mary and, da- and Joseph, this is their first baby. And not only that, but God has told them who this baby is. It's Jesus. It's the Messiah, the Savior they've been waiting on. And this is who this is. And so when they go to this place, this town for the census, and they realize there's nowhere for them to stay because everyone's back in town for the census. So all the rooms are taken up. They've had to go slow because they have a very pregnant Mary with them, right? And so now all of a sudden it's time for the baby to come. And I would imagine if I'm them, I'm freaking out because the baby's coming and they have nowhere to go. And so it says it really quickly in just a few sentences. But it's time for the baby to come. They have the baby. There's nowhere for them to stay. So they put the baby in a manger, which is a place that holds food for animals. And so 
literally he's placed in a barn type situation with animals as a newborn. Now, if you have a baby now, I got to be honest with you, it's like crazy, sterile, clean environment that happens. It's nowhere close to a, a barn or a manger, okay? So the baby is born and immediately the medical professionals take the baby and start cleaning the baby up, put the baby in an incubator to keep it warm. They take measurements. They make sure the baby's healthy. They do all these things for the baby. And then eventually give the baby back to the parents. And it's all in this clean, sterile environment with all these uh, clean cloths, towels, blankets, beds, all of this stuff to make sure the baby's healthy, the mom is taken care of, everybody's good, right? This is not at all what happens with Jesus. He is brought to this town that he doesn't, isn't in. Like Mary and Joseph don't typically live here, just where Joseph is from. They're here. They have nowhere to stay. It's time to have a baby. And they have nowhere like sterile to do this. Nowhere clean. It's not like a typical birth situation. So they make do with what they have, and he's born in this stable barn area. Crazy that the Savior of the world, like let this sink in, the Savior of all humanity, past, present, future, comes on this one particular moment through this one particular couple, and they have nowhere to put him except for in a manger, a place that holds animal food. This is the coming of the king, the coming of the son of God. And this is where he's placed. This is where he's born. So his audience are animals. Like they're the ones to receive him into the world. And this young couple that's got to be petrified and scared to death because they're having their first kid in a barn. So let's keep reading. In verse 8, it says, there, And there were shepherds living out in the field nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So Paul's right there. So it's important to know who shepherds are in the scheme and the grand scale of the society at the time, right? So in every society, there's just kind of a hierarchy that people have and a way people think of one another in this society. For example, right now, if you were to say someone is an attorney or a doctor or an astronaut, All of us would kind of hold those people in high regard. We would have a lot of respect for those people for what they do and their profession. If you were to say back in the day, hey, someone is a king or a prince, you would be like, oh my goodness, they're a big deal, right? I mean, that's just the way it is. With all these generations in different societies, there's kind of a hierarchy to what's who's important and who's not, right? That's just kind of what happens. It happens in school, right? Think about middle school. You know certain people are viewed as more important than others. Now, in reality, especially when you start to realize who God has made us to be, you realize there's not really a hierarchy. God values all of us equally. He loves us all equally. But when it comes to jobs and things, societies do value certain things more than others. So when you're looking at the society in this day, when Jesus is born, If you wanted to put someone at the bottom of the totem pole, looked at as kind of one of the lowliest things that you could do, it would be the shepherds because they hang out with animals all day. They're not around people. They don't need to have manners. They don't need to smell good. They don't need to dress nice. So therefore, they didn't do all those things. They smelled bad. They dressed badly. They hung out with sheep all day. I mean, they really were kind of looked down on when they entered into cities and towns. And so 
again, you think about how Jesus was just born in a farm, like manger place where animals eat. This is where the baby who is going to save the world is. And then as soon as that happens, God tells through an angel some people, like immediately. And who does he tell? He doesn't go tell the king. He doesn't go to the governor. He doesn't go tell all the doctors or all the important people in the town. He goes to the shepherds and he tells them in a field where they work with their animals. Hey, the savior of the world, the Messiah has been born. And this is where he is. And he's wrapped up in a diaper in a manger. So you know who he is. And he tells the shepherds first. This is nuts. Like, this is not at all the way you would think the announcement of the Messiah would be. Because this this is who we've been waiting on. And when I say we, I mean like humanity. Been waiting on a Savior to restore us and redeem us and rescue us from our sin ever since the fall back in the beginning of humanity with Adam and Eve. And so he tells the shepherds of all people, hey, I've brought my son into the world. The Messiah is here. And I'm telling you. So let's pick up the story from there. Verse 16, it says, So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, his, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. So this, my friends, is the Christmas story. It is the coming, the birth of the Messiah. It's the coming of Jesus. And this really unassuming way that he comes into the world. Surrounded by animals, two scared teenagers, and a bunch of stinky shepherds. This is Jesus' story. And so there's things for us to pull away from this story and learn about it and also celebrate. Like Christmas is about celebrating. It's about hope. It's about joy. It's about being thankful. And it's because of Jesus that all of that is what Christmas is about. And so when you think about how Jesus entered the world, it wasn't with a bunch of crazy announcements and YouTube videos and teaser trailers and this grand entrance into the world and this nice facility or palace with this huge parade. Like none of that happened for Jesus. He was born with no one really around, just some animals and eventually some shepherds. And he's not in the cleanest of environments. He is not showered with all of this stuff. I mean, he is just so unassumingly brought into the world in this humble way. But yet he is the Prince of Peace. He's the King of Kings. He's the name above all names. He's Jesus. So it's like, what does that tell us about who he is? Well, I think it challenges how we think of greatness, right? It challenges what we think of when we think of what a big deal is and how maybe we should think of what's important and what isn't important. And because Christmas, even though presents are amazing, right? Presents are awesome. I love them. I love to get them, love to give them. All of it's fun. But at the end of the day, it isn't about stuff, right? The presents even are not about stuff. It's about the heart behind the stuff. It's about the person who gave it to you, what they're trying to communicate. It's about what you're trying to communicate to someone else when you give them a gift. It it really is all about communicating love. And you think about Jesus as the ultimate gift ever given. And how he was born and given out of love. God loves us. He loves you. He loves you so much that he gave you his son. He gave you Jesus. He gave you a way back to him. And he isn't this king that's put up in this high pedestal way up in this castle. You got to go through a bunch of guards to get to him. You got to pay a bunch of money. He is not that kind of king. 
He is the king of kings. And he's accessible to everyone who says they desire him, who realize that they need him, who are willing and ready to repent of their sin and accept him as the Messiah. He's accessible to everyone. And so that is, I think, one of the main things we can take away from this story. He is not the kind of king that maybe we think of when we think king. He is not the, even back in the day when they thought of the Savior, what he was going to look like. He doesn't look quite like that. And so he exemplifies and shows us exactly what he talks about later on in his life when he says the last will be first and the first will be last. To actually have life, you have to give up your life. In a lot of ways, Jesus flips everything we think, flips it on its head. And it's different, but it's better. And so Jesus, at Christmas time, he is someone to celebrate and to know he's accessible to everybody. He's a gift given to all humanity, to every person, regardless of what you do, regardless of how valuable you think you are, regardless of your job, your income, where you live, your family situation. Jesus is a gift to you. He offers you hope. He offers you joy. He offers you love. And all you have to do is accept it. And so this should bring us to a place of just gratitude and thankfulness. Because that is the case for us, not just at Christmas, but all of the time. God has offered himself to us all of the time because of what he's done through Jesus. By sending him into the world over 2,000 years ago. And so this is what we celebrate at Christmas. This is why we get so excited. This is why we give gifts to one another. To commemorate this greatest gift that was given. To remember it. To celebrate it and be excited about it. And so I would say the, the other main point other than what it teaches us about Jesus is what it can teach us about us. And what it can continue to help point us to. To not only these attitudes of gratitude, these, this, this place of thankfulness, but it would also help us to be generous people. That we would be people because of our generous God, that as his sons and daughters, that we would be generous as well. We'd be generous with our love, our affection. We'd be generous with our kindness. We'd be generous with whatever it is that God has blessed us with, whatever resources, that we would be generous. We would give freely because we love the way our Father in heaven loves. And so this Christmas, let's do that. Let's reflect on who Jesus is. Let's be thankful that he came and he came not in a way that is unaccessible and far off in no way for us to even know him, but he is very much down in the real world with us. He was born with a bunch of animals. Shepherds, the lowliest of the low, were the ones invited in first just to make sure we all get it, okay? You're invited in. You have been offered the gift of Jesus. So let's reflect on that. Let's, if we haven't accepted that, accept that gift of Jesus. And let's thank him like never before this Christmas for who he is, for his love for us, for the gift that is Jesus. And then let's take that gift and go and be generous as well. Let's go and give as well. Let's look for opportunities to constantly be reflecting the heart of our Father by loving everyone we come in contact with and being generous with them. And that isn't just a Christmas thing, right? That's a thing we're called to all of the time. So if that's you and you want to accept that gift of Jesus, maybe for the first time, I just want to invite you. It's super, super simple. God just says, if you confess in, with your heart and confess, with your, let, let's try that again. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, that you'll be saved. It's as simple as that. It's just accepting this gift. It's receiving it. And then after that, you've been saved. Like you are now a son and daughter of God. You've received that gift. Now it's experiencing the gift. It's taking steps every day just to follow Jesus, to know him better, to understand how much he loves you and how much he loves everyone else and who he is and who he's called you to be. And that is a lifelong process that is full of all kinds of great things. So I want to challenge you and encourage you to do that. 
And I want to challenge you as well as myself to really be grateful this season, this Christmas. And as we thank God to look for opportunities for us to be able to be givers the way he is to us. So I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for me. Pray that you have an amazing Christmas. Pray that you're able to do all those things we just said and take away these things from the the Christmas story, the birth of Jesus and uh, the coming of the Messiah. So let's reflect on those things and just pray for us to be able to live those things out this Christmas. And then we'll see you here in just a couple weeks, January the 5th, when we come back to Revolution in 2022 and uh, and get the rest of this, this school year kicked off. So love you guys like crazy. I want to pray for you and hope you have an amazing Christmas. God, we love you. Thank you so much for Jesus coming. Thank you for the story that we just read from Luke chapter 2 and the reality of it, the fact that it really happened and that you really did send Jesus into the world, that you offer him as this gift for all of us to accept and experience. And in doing that, we get to embrace our true identity as sons and daughters. We get to accept this gift of love. So help us to do that and just be so thankful because of it. Help us to be just really grateful through this season. As we go through Christmas, as we give gifts and receive gifts, help us to constantly just in the back of our heads and in our hearts be reflecting and thankful for you and for Jesus. And that in these gifts, we're actually celebrating that greatest gift of him and the fact that he's offered to everyone and he's accessible to everyone. And so help us also to be generous and to give the same way you gave to us. Help us to look for opportunities to give of ourselves, to give of, of things that you've given us, to do it joyfully, to do it with gratitude, and to do it with love in our hearts, God. And so we love you. We thank you for being able to celebrate Christmas and the coming of Jesus, be able to have time with friends and family, be able to have some time off from school and from work and things like that, and uh, to be able to rest. So help us all to do that and, um, and just to continue to grow and following after Jesus. We love you, God, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, love you guys like crazy, and we'll see you in a couple weeks. Peace.